Welcome everyone to this session on coastal on the coastal zone and its development and more or less the need for evidence-based solutions for management. I'm Mats Björk from Stockholm University. I will be moderator for this session. Uh, and we have a panel here. The panel is selected to talk about development in the coastal zone. We all know that the, the coastal zone area today is feeding an increased part of the population. We also know that the coastal zones ecosystems in, in, are in turn feeding other ecosystems, making this part of the environment both extremely important and vulnerable. We're seeing an increased pressure, like in many parts on the, uh, in the world. We're seeing by there increased dangers for these zones, but also hopefully increasing opportunities, which if taken care of in a good way, could lead to a slightly more positive development. So in order to answer or at least give the questions for what are the needs for evidence-based solution in this area, and what can science contribute? We have invited a board uh, which will give their views very, very shortly, and then we hope for a discussion, a long discussion afterwards. We have Martin Gullström from Södertörn University, marine ecologist, who will start talking. We have Inger Neslund from the WWF, uh, who in many years has been working with the coastal, uh, coastal zones, coastal inhabitants and their needs and management. And we have Linus Hammer from the Swedish Board of Water Management, which actually has a longer title, but yeah, who will talk, I hope, a bit positively on the possibility of a real management of, of coastal areas. Okay, I will not linger further. I will leave the floor to Martin Gullström. I will uh, talk about healthy seascapes and uh, how this is connected to global change environment. Um, seascapes, um, that's uh, an important word today. It's, um, we talk about seascape approach, we talk about seascape ecology, which is wider than ecology. It's, uh, we talk about uh, land-sea interactions in the coastal zone and the ecosystems that build up uh, seascapes, but also uh, the importance for so many people in the coastal zone around the world, both in developed and developing countries. And uh, seascapes can be beautiful. They are uh, important, critical for organisms, of course, and habitats. They are critical for us. A lot of uh, development in the coastal zone. Uh, and uh, in many developing countries, tropical, this is from Tanzania, uh, it's the livelihood. Uh, it's uh, the food, the food security, and it's the income. So it's, it's extremely important for, for example, the tourism, fisheries, and so on. And seascapes in, in tropical countries is commonly seen as different kinds of coastal ecosystems interacting in, in different ways. They are like in the coastal zone, we have mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs. They are regulating a lot of services. And they are, have so many important functions, and they interact in different ways. Coral reefs buffer against, for example, weather, stormy weather, and, and so to the other systems, which and the other systems feed uh, coral reefs with organisms and nutrients and, and are also filtered to, uh, to too much nutrients. They also interact and uh, 
with the society, so there are synergies between the systems, uh, while also with um, um, society. For example, tourism, it's linked to habitat protection, so good habitats, good tourism. Fisheries, it's very much linked to all those systems, otherwise it's not a good outcome in the fisheries productivity and so on. Uh, so co healthy coastal, eco uh, coastal seascapes are so important for, um, for human and for society uh, through their well-being and resilience. And, and the outcome is a lot of ecosystem services, it's environmental services, regulating, supporting services, economic services and social cultural services. But we also as humans need to be regenerative and sustainable, have um, approached this, the environment with sustainable actions. And this I show just because I want to highlight also that the ecosystem, the ecological integrity is so important, the functions and the processes and the high biodiversity to actually lead to seascape or ecosystem conditions uh, at a good state and healthy state. We are so many uh, people in the coastal zone around the world. There's a large number of users, a large number of activities going on. So it's an extreme jigsaw to solve those problems. And that's what, what has been going on now for some decades. We are building up a, a broader approach to management. Even though we focus on specific species also, we also look into ecosystem uh, whole ecosystem, we call it ecosystem-based approaches, and so on, uh, where marine or spatial planners on terrestrial environments are planning this in the best way. But then we have the major problems all over the world. There are environmental changes because of us. There are impacts at global and local uh, level, uh, all from over-exploitation of our resources to changes. We are using land in different ways and we are modifying and destroying our land. Uh, pollution, invasive species, and upon that climate change and, and many more uh, impacts. So all those impacts, they are driving also the structural change at different scales, at different spatial scales. It can be plants up to major landscapes, how we fragment them and affect connectivity. I come back to connectivity. And, and, and this will affect ecosystem functions and services. Uh, when we talk about seascape and in, for example, uh, seascape ecology or landscape ecology, when we work with major uh, areas in the coastal zone, we talk about scale also. Scale is so important. One organism is, um, has a seascape that is not ex at all uh, the same as another ones. And, and we also need to understand the interaction between temporal and spatial scales, because so many impacts, so many uh, processes are interacting between different scales. And for example, if you introduce a protected area, that is at a certain scale, and that should go in line with the scales we are uh, trying to understand and protect uh, at different ways. Connectivity, that's a, a, a word and a concept or so that has been raised since long time, but it's very, very tricky to actually bring in in a very good way into management and, and policies. But it's a work that is going on, ongoing, and it's progressing very much now around the world. For example, IUCN, IUCN um, has a guideline for connectivity through networks and corridors and linked this to global uh, major uh, management initiatives and connectivity initiatives. Also, for example, Convention on Biological Diversity calls for connectivity uh, between protected areas and restoring also connectivity between degraded systems. Connectivity, yes, it could be just an easy example is a fish 
that need so many different environments to fulfill the life stage, all life stages. Uh, maybe a fish is using seagrasses and mangroves nursery, live on the, the, uh, as adult outside in the coral reefs, and, and the open water is also important because of uh, the larvae that are spawned. They, they go with the currents and then settle in another environment. Uh, another um, example of connectivity I will mention now in the final part here is uh, to fulfill um, Paris Agreement goal and climate change goals the last um, years, one of the major things we have already heard it today highlighted is uh, the problem of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which we are just f feeling more and more. And uh, this is because of, of course, co uh, coal, oil and gas and cement, but also because of land use in different ways. We are uh, destroying environments and, and uh, there is habitat modification, habitat loss and so on. Luckily, we have natural carbon sinks, uh, which is a sort of nature-based solution. Um, at least um, this can be done in many ways, but this is our nature. So we are only on 417 ppm today, which is way too much because of our land and ocean sinks. Uh, in the marine environment, we talk about coastal blue carbon and ocean blue carbon, and green carbon is the, the, the carbon that is absorbed in the terrestrial environment. And the coastal zone is extremely efficient in sequestering carbon because of high productivity, slow decomposition when it comes down to the sediment, and input from surrounding environments, surrounding habitats, a huge part. So vegetation in the coastal zone contributes carbon sink capacity, and they can fuel each other. Vegetation can, can go from one area and carbon end up in another environment. So we need connectivity, we cannot just this, um, lose some of the systems. And this we don't know so much yet about, but it's an on ongoing studies nowadays. For in one earlier study uh, in along the East African coast, we found that blue carbon sequestration in seagrass meadows are influenced by the landscape configuration and that uh, fragmentation of different habitats makes it worse. Uh, continuous areas, but with influence from other habitats are very important. And if you disturb uh, areas, a carbon sink could go to a carbon source with an emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, so that is also a major problem. I will end up with two slides here about uh, seascape um, ecology. We, together with a lot of colleagues, we did a study to identify research priorities for emerging ocean sustainable science. And uh, this was based on a special uh, Delphi method that I don't go into, but academic expert in seascape ecology, senior managers and conservation practitioners uh, were involved uh, and, and uh, put up questions, all of us. And in the end, we had a list of uh, one, more than 100, 150, questions that was uh, put into nine themes. And in the end, uh, I don't show all results, but interestingly, 65% of, of experts in um, science and expert practitioners in conservation and management agreed about 65% of the research questions. And the themes could be like seascape change, seascape connectivity, ecosystem-based management, restoration, sustainability, science, and, and so on. So finally, key challenges. We need to uh, think about those. Balancing food provision from oceans and coasts with nature protection. It should be meeting climate goals while maintaining nature's and nature's contribu contribution to people. Resourcing growing um, citizens while maintaining the nature that underpins them. Feeding humanity without degrading nature on land, conserving and restoring nature while contributing positively to human well-being, and maintaining fresh water for nature and humanity. So there are some 
key challenges in conservation nature and nature's conservation to people while achieving still uh, the sustainable development goals adopted by the United Nations. And that gives both trade-offs and synergies in that way. Thank you from a pelagic seascape, hopefully fairly healthy. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, we will take questions after the three presentations. So I give the word now to Inger Neslund. Welcome. I'm Inge Neslund from WWF Sweden. I'm a senior advisor for marine and fisheries. And um, my work has been all over the place, I'd ra rather say. But one part is uh, the Indian Ocean and uh, our work there together with colleagues. WWF is presented in more than 100 countries. And in most of those countries, the protection of the ocean includes projects and policy work on local, regional, national, and global scale. This counts for protected areas, fishing management, exploitation of oil and gas, as well as deep sea mining, and all is covered by the Agenda 2030. How can we do a sustainable development within our fields? Uh, we think that there is no way to make a holistic change uh, by working in just one area, as the ocean, its water and its life are all linked together uh, and also exposed by climate change and the contamination of other, other uh, things in the air. Uh, from a policy and practice point of view, we are working with climate change, but we think we need to have to secure the ocean biodiversity and halt the climate change. Uh, it's a crucial combination for functional and productive ecosystems that Martin talked about. Uh, and this is independent on where on the globe you are. Uh, for the regional and coastal areas, uh, we could say that we, we can push within the United Nations global agenda and within the, their different uh, meetings, like the, the last one in Portugal, um, the, the ocean uh, decade. Uh, but we can also work on, on governmental decisions within the countries we work uh, and making the decision bodies to be alert on what is needed. We also, during our work, base all the discussions on scientific publications or scientific uh, discussions. So our uh, overall goal is a productive and resilient ocean ecosystem, sustaining human well-being and conserving biodiversity. We need to connect these two together. By 2030, we would like to see an effectively managed uh, ocean with at least 30% of the area uh, under uh, protection uh, and significantly reduce the impacts. We think we can do this if all work together, scientists, decision makers, from the local to the global. Uh, of course, this is a hard work, but this is our, our goal or outcome. And by 2030, we also would like to, to see that we have doubled the world's sustainable managed fisheries, which is food for people. But it's also a very important part in a living ecosystem. The fish is not only food, it's also for the ecosystem. Our focus is uh, for, uh, for coastal communities. Uh, you can see the middle column there. Uh, we, we will work with no deep seabed mining, which is on an international scale, but also on a, a national level to have countries to vote for a moratorium on the deep seabed mining, as we know too little 
to start to disturb the seabed on the deep areas. But we also work with Blue Futures, which is sustainable blue economy that can be on very different levels, but one level is within the coastal communities. And uh, we have a very strong focus on community-led conservation, which include local fisheries management. So both conservation and the access to food. Uh, and to combine these things are, are very important. We have, you can also see shark recovery there and coral reef rescue to how to protect coral reefs that are now in a very scarce situation globally with the climate, uh, climate change, but also the fisheries that is taken too much on both in open water, but along the coastal lines. We see now shark fishing in areas where they've never been fishing shark before due to the demand globally. And those are the top predator that also um, regulate the whole ecosystem. So the tropical seas focus for us in Sweden has mainly been the Indian Ocean. And to, to be able to keep all the good uh, biodiversity uh, in combination with uh, people's well-being, we do have uh, quite a bit of funding from uh, the Swedish Development Aid, SIDA, uh, and that is to support civil society. I think this is one very important part in our work uh, to connect science, decision makers, and the civil society rights in a line that can keep the oceans and the coastal water specifically in a good condition. There are, um, of course, important to ensure both the development, uh, that the development aid include climate change and resilience work, as well as to support and secure marine biodiversity. Uh, of course, also freshwater and terrestrial biodiversity, because it's all, all there connected. Uh, so what we do is we have two programs. One is called the Civil uh, Leading the Change, and the other one, Voices of Diversity, that we work within our colleagues, uh, especially in East Africa, the West Indian Ocean Seascape Regional Program. But it's not only the regional program, it's also the national program. And what we try to do is to synchronize ourselves so that every, every country, every office will have the same uh, main points to work with. And then, of course, you have to work according to your own national um, radar or what is needed specifically there. But um, WWF has a unique position to collaborate with civil society, governmental bodies, ensure good governance in countries, and give ownership to the coastal communities. Uh, it doesn't matter how much science we have, if we don't have a connection between how uh, people's needs are and uh, restrictions, law setting within the government. But also the local, I would say like counties uh, in different areas. Uh, we ha I have a few examples from Madagascar, Mozambique and Tanzania where the coastal community work has really been a good uh, asset to give local management plans. But to have a local management plan for your, for your fish and for your environment, for the biodiversity, you need to be accepted as an organization within the national government. And that is a process where we also can support and where I think science can support. Uh, we would like to work continuously with the ecosystem-based perspective, uh, with the Aichi principles, uh, and uh, without people we can't save our oceans, so we need to collaborate. For the science, uh, as I said in the beginning, we are basing, based with all our knowledge on science. We are 
science-driven organization working in dialogue with many different actors and on many different levels. I'm not doing the whole work. We are a big group of people. <clears throat> so just to finalize, it's all connected. And remember that when you continue to discuss and when you continue to work with your scientific tasks. Thank you. Thanks, Mats and the conference for inviting me and um, the very difficult world, sw word Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. So here we are in the middle of the web. We are the national authority uh, for uh, managing lakes and rivers and sea. And we work, of course, together with a lot of other um, authorities on regional level and national level and also under the uh, European Union. I also want to show you uh, a big storage facility for tobacco in Gothenburg. Here you can imagine a lot of Swedish snus being made. Uh, but this is also our uh, headquarters. So we are around 300 employees and most of us are here in Gothenburg. But we work also with more international business. We have a, a unit for international cooperation and that means international outside of the EU. We have also many colleagues working with on the EU level, of course. We are running three uh, quite large programs for capacity building and, um, and uh, bilateral collaborations. And most of it is actually carried out in the same region as Inge was uh, mentioning here. The, and Martin, you also had examples from the Western Indian Ocean. And one may wonder, perhaps, maybe not in this, in, in this room, but in other rooms, one may wonder why we are here. But Sweden has been working with East Africa for, for decades and decades and, and, and invested a lot to infrastructure and, and capacity building over the years. And we have good friendship and we are, we are very welcome in this region. Uh, it's also a region where we have many of the, the least developed countries and a population or populations living very, very close to the marine ecosystems. Our work is much together with the uh, Nairobi Convention, which is a bit similar to, to HELCOM, it's a regional seas convention, uh, containing 10 countries, those who are marked here. We also work together with the IOC UNESCO. But so that's a bit of a background, but I, I was invited here to, to comment a bit on how we can encourage sustainable governance of coastal uh, areas. And I think I will touch upon uh, both of the previous uh, speakers. Martin, you talked a lot about uh, connectivity, which will also be re-mentioned here. You even had um, a pelagic species uh, in the end, which I like very much, <laughs> because I'm going to come to the importance of that. Uh, Inge, you also um, uh, talked about the, uh, uh, the important of, importance of connecting science with policy and also to have a right-based approach when working. I mean, there's one thing to preserve environment, but we must also use environment, especially in this region. Uh, at least in our case, and I think in, in your as well, the main goal is to reduce poverty. Uh, so, so first I wanted to, to mention connectivity here, that what we have noted is that it's essential to not only focus on the coastal habitats, but also to bring them together with the, the pelagic, like the outside, uh, for you who are not marine biologists, uh, like the bigger sea, where we have fishing, where the international fishing fleets come in and wipe up everything so that the local population don't get much left. And, uh, these policies are often handled in separate rooms from the more uh, local uh, coastal ecosystem management. So that is something that we need to change and uh, the Nairobi Convention is working trying to change that and of course we encourage that. And then we have the cross-sectorial aspects. Marine spatial planning is one example of working cross-sectorial, and it's, it's a new instrument and provides a window of opportunity that I will uh, soon present more on. 
And then I will also mention blue economy, as blue economy is something that some governments think that you can just go out in the ocean and dig up gold from the, from the deep seafloor, and that is often not the case. We need to look into realistic expectations, and we need to make sure that the growth stays in the local community and doesn't end up in, in other pockets. So if I'm going in now to just illustrate a little bit about marine spatial planning, what is that? As you see here, the sea can be very busy. It's often not this busy, but a lot of things happening in the sea, especially in the coastal zone, and it's increasing. All over the world, it's increasing. And marine spatial planning has to do with prioritizing the, uh, the space between different sectors so that one place has a priority for fishing, another one for shipping, a third for conservation, and in the best case, many of them can be combined, but it has to do with, with saying, saying no to some things and yes to other things. Uh, we have done this on land for 100 years, so it's nothing new, but it's very new to do this in, sea, in the sea. And on the left side, you see uh, the, uh, this, the, one of the Swedish marine special plants, and on the right side, you see the embryo to uh, the marine special plan of the Seychelles. And SWOM, uh, we are working a lot on capacity building on marine spatial planning. And we can do that because we have been and we are the responsible agency for marine spatial planning in Sweden. So we have the, the, um, um, the experience, but of course they are doing something else in other countries. But we can bring in what, what we think you should think of and what you should not do. And then we can also facilitate south to south learning. We can also bring in new knowledge. Uh, we have asked the uh, University of Gothenburg to develop several studies here targeting gender aspects and poverty aspects in marine spatial planning. Because in Sweden we don't have much experience from those fields. And there is not much out there on these aspects. But it's super important that now when a new instrument comes in, how can we make sure that it pays attention to gender aspects and poverty aspects? In summary, marine spatial planning is the uh, planning of ocean space. It's a new instrument. Almost all East African countries are implementing it or beginning to. The drivers, they can be blue economy, it's often like that, or it can be sustainability, as in the case of the Seychelles. It is an opportunity for uh, weaving in connectivity into marine management to be truly cross-sectorial, have to negotiate between all the different sectors transboundary, crossing borders, both natural borders and, and um, borders between countries. Uh, it must be ecosystem-based if it's going to end well, and it is a good place to bring in science. And there's a lot of room for capacity building here because it's a very new instrument. So now, quickly moving forward uh, to one of the tools that we can use within marine spatial planning. We have ships in the ocean, but we also have fishing, eutrophication, all sorts, marine mining, you mentioned, Inge. Uh, so when you do the planning, you need to understand how this, all of it affects the environment at the same time. So Benjamin Halpern, as was presented by you, Martin, uh, did a study where he and his research team could illustrate where do we have high cumulative impact, combined impact, and where do we have low. So if this map was given to the King Neptune, he would be very angry on those people living in the, in the Scandinavia, for instance, in the, in the UK and in the Far East, because they're polluting and destroying environments much more than other places. But this is also information that is very important if you conduct marine spatial planning. The uh, method that, that they used is to combine a lot of spatial maps on human activities and on ecosystem components, such as uh, seagrass, um, fish, and so on. And then also to have a sensitivity matrix that explained how sensitive is the whale to the ship, and so on. We adopted this in the Swedish marine spatial planning, and we made a tool where we can, we can simulate what happens. We can look into what, how do the cumulative impact look now, but also what happens if we do policy change 
if we do different plans, how will the cumulative impact change? Then we can evaluate our marine plants before they are they're set in stone. We can compare different outcomes. Of course, it never, it's never environment that wins, at least not fully wins. We can compare plants and the outcomes of plants. Uh, often the negotiated versions of the plants are not completely environmental friendly, but at least better than it is now, for instance. And you can, we can run this analysis for any given area. We can also follow the trace of, of pressure. So who is affecting what? This is very informative when, when, when um, dealing with the priorities of interest between different uh, areas. And as you can understand, of course, there's a lot of uncertainties here. And they, it can only be used on a strategic level. But this is, has been very, very good for us in Sweden to work with. And we are now working together with the Nairobi Convention to have the same tool implemented in the Western Indian Ocean. As a big job, all these different maps need to be developed and we need models. We have a lot of open data, uh, but there is not all data for all the places. We then work together with very skillful uh, partners, both Swedish partners such as the the um, Geological Survey of Sweden and uh, SLU Aqua, the universities and Gothenburg University and so on, uh, and together with African partners, of course. Uh, all the member states of the uh, Nairobi Convention is part of this work. So we have done this remotely, uh, mostly, over the last couple of years. And what, what we do is to bring in data, rework the data, make models that, is, that are sound, and then develop the, the tool, which looks like this in the Swedish context, and will look like this in the um, Nairobi Convention context. And we will have a launching event of this tool in October, so it's only two months from, from being there, and I'm sure we have to rework a lot of it uh, afterwards. But it is something that the governments can use for addressing environmental issues as they do uh, policy and, and planning uh, on a strategic level. So marine spatial planning should consider everything, and that's why this is needed. We also um, have used a method that is scientifically based, but of course, a lot of uncertainties still there to consider. We work together with uh, representatives from 10 different countries and our, our Swedish partners. And it's truly science to policy. This, is, this will be uh, information for policymakers to use. And the people that we work with in those countries, are bo we bo work both with, uh, with uh, marine ecologists and with uh, managers. And the tool will be totally owned and hosted uh, by the Nairobi Convention. So Sweden will not have anything to do with this once it's there, uh, other than help on request. So my last topic, I believe I, I'm, I'm running low on time, uh, is the super importance of enabling local blue growth. We, we talked about um, where, which pockets the money ends in. Uh, and we wish to make sure that, that poverty uh, alleviation is really the, the end goal when using new marine resources. First of all, we need to know what is it that we're going to dig out of the sea that we haven't digged out already. Uh, what we find in the studies that we have made is that it's the largest potential uh, rests in coastal tourism, environmental such, and uh, mariculture. There's not too much fish to go out and get that we haven't found yet and so on. Some countries also have uh, oil and gas. And then we have looked into 10 or 9, sorry, we've looked into factors that actually enable local blue growth. And those nine factors that we find out, they are infrastructure like electricity, maritime infrastructure, access to credits, we have to have law that works, value chains, and environmental law, and innovation and strategic planning and so on. So if you're interested in that, just download this quite fresh new report and see what we found based on, on four targeted studies. But it can altogether spell out like co-development. We cannot expect anyone to start a fish farm and then the, the community will immediately start to, 
to bloom, we need to have other aspects in uh, there as well. And I think that on, on a conference like this, uh, it's not a big news, but some people need to hear this. So co coming back to the last, uh, the previous questions, I just want to underscore that we need to bring together coastal and offshore marine management. Marine special planning provides a window of opportunity and we need to look into the local low growth and co-development is important there. Thank you so much and here are some links. Thank you, Linus. So we're opening it up for, uh, for questions from the audience and also online. Uh, yes, oh, already. Uh, there. I think in the second row was the first one, right? Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Clara Ostadius. I'm from the International Center for Local Democracy. Thank you very much for great presentations. And you have touched quite extensively on um, the local aspect of this. But I was also curious for a bit more in depth on uh, the role of local governments in this and what is still needed to strengthen multi-level governance for for this. Thank you. So, Inge, do you want to take that? Use this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what we think is very important is to involve local people and civil society. And I have a few examples from the area. So one is uh, octopus fishing, which is uh, partly a gender issue, as it's women who are collecting octopus along the coastline. And uh, colleagues in Mozambique they, uh, and in Madagascar, they've done a tremendous work on trying to inform how uh, closures can, um, can give a better income. So they made, uh, uh, together with the local fisheries um, and with the government, because you need to have the government uh, accepting this. Um, but they did, an, uh, you can say, a trial uh, where they closed some areas for three months, some for six months, and some for nine months. And all the people were there to see how it's going. Uh, when you open the fisheries, the, the oct this is only octopus fisheries. So when you open the fisheries, you can, they could see that a nine-month closure gave a double-sized octopus. So from one kilo, they fished octopuses that was two kilos or two and a half kilos. That's a very clear management effect of what, what happens when you leave part of the coastal area alone. Another one was uh, what, what Martin was talking about, part of a um, marine spatial planning, but a protected area. And um, WWF asked whether they could close the, the coral reef. No, 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 no. So then they agreed with the fishermen that, okay, you point out what is the area. And of course, WWF got the area where there is no fish any longer and only small coral bummies. But they accepted that. And during seven years, they followed up with a local scientific um, I I inventory uh, two times a year and in the seventh year this area was a lot of fish even so much that they could fish outside the closed area six months later the local fishermen came to WWF and said we want to give a suggestion of a new closed area for fisheries and that was the coral reef. Because that gives the reef and the ecosystem a chance to uh, be healthy. And it also gives the dolphins around the reef uh, a free, free area to swim. And they realize that dolphins are interesting for tourists and fish is interesting for restaurants 
and of course for the livelihood for people. But you need to have these kind of uh, connections and, and the civil society is very, very important. All the baseline was, uh, of course, scientific ground. Thank you, Inge, I think. Sure. Just showing the need of, of having bottom-up projects in this kind. Where really, and, and there are several more examples like this showing that it can be progress. We had several more questions. Yes? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as you can see, I come from uh, medicine and global health. And I think this is a very new subject for me. But, um, <clears throat> but I think there's an interconnectedness between ecoservice systems and health or social well-being. So I uh, would like to hear more on the interconnectedness on if, if there has been any studies been done where there have been a lot of biodiversity um, loss, especially the marine biodiversity loss, and what has been uh, the effect on health, uh, human health. Because as we have seen the COVID-19 pandemic, is, um, is just one of them that's coming up with new disease coming up. So these biodiversity loss that's taking place at the marine level, has there been <clears throat> any studies been done and uh, from coming from a medicine and global health, um, I would very like, must like to be linked, at least know uh, on this, the biodiversity health and human health, because this is going to be a new agenda for development as well as understanding because of the climate change, as well as the one uh, Lisa mentioned in the morning that we are in towards the doomsday very soon. Okay. Uh, a quick answer from yep. me. Is it done? Yeah. is that yes, the, we haven't done research on that, uh, but of course there are a lot of papers on this. Uh, if you have um, a biodiversity loss and you lose the system, the production of fish and crayfish and octopuses are not good, which leads to um, to fame and, and uh, poverty, of course. And that was very clear during two hurricanes that came on to Mozambique a couple of years ago, which is a drastic thing, but it shows very well what happens. And that is what we are going to if we don't care about the oceans and halt the climate change. So you're talking about the direct link, of course, between uh, livelihood loss and health, which is quite apparent, of course. Yeah. But it's very evident that it's there in this area. In fact, uh, in fact uh, there were a lot of people dying at that, those mm. events. I mean, it was extreme. So it was not only indirectly through the food, but also uh, directly in many ways. Also, by they were sick from cholera, etc., uh, directly in this environment. So, climate change had a very direct and indirect effect. In that. Yes, so we had a question over there. Yeah, thanks for your presentations. Neil Powell from Uppsala University. Um, we've spoken a lot about evidence based approaches, role of science, role of policy, but Many of us know that um, in these coastal zones um, there is often no evidence because we have enormous conflicts of interest. There are different perspectives in terms of how these coastal zones should see, how we would like them to see. It's not, not that there is a perfect coast, coastal zone. Um, we also know that in many of these contexts policy is, is there's very low compliance in terms of policy. So it's a little bit like an empty vessel and it's not going to necessarily enable change. Um, so often, often the problems in these coastal zones are, are more uh, relational problems. It has to do with relationships between different stakeholders that neither science or policy are particularly good at dealing with. I just, I just wondered if you have some reflections going beyond evidence-based approaches to bringing about transformation in coastal zones. And my last point is, um, we were talking about marine spatial planning and you talked about coastal zones and oceans, but I'm thinking about the land. <laughs> These are not closed systems and we have agriculture and we have forestry and we have industries along the coast and so on. So, so I, I'm thinking a little bit about how do you bring on board those stakeholders into, into your marine spatial planning? 
that's a very broad question, or is actually several questions in it. Actually, I think I will steal the first part of it, even though being not part of the panel. Uh, because you're obviously right. Uh, uh, we see all these problems and, and, and as trying to start to see one solution of this, we're building up a model tri a trial in a community in the, in the northern part of Tanzania, which is heavily dependent on both fisheries and, and shallow water, in shallow waters and, and mangrove, uh, which of course in this area include coconut plantation. All of them very, very sensitive to global change and uh, any kind of, of effects on the, uh, on the vegetation. Uh, and it's built from the societies. It's, it's from the University of Dar es Salaam. It will go on for five years. We'll be trying to have a discussion with the, the farmers, the fishermen, etc., to set up uh, a special economic zone in here where we can try the solutions with discussion from the, 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 uh, the villages within. Uh, and then we would have evaluate for well, five years is what we could get. That's a very short time, of course, but at least a trial. Uh, and it's based on African scientists trained within in Sweden. Uh, who's coming back and giving this to the community. Uh, this is not an answer to your question, which was very wide, but it said that it's one hope that we will be able to answer some of these questions. How do we actually get it? How do we get solutions that can be viable because they're accepted of the people who are involved? Unfortunately, I will have to stop here. Not only talking myself, I have to stop the the, um, uh, the session. We only have two minutes left. And I want to say something. I also want to advertise my own, uh, which is uh, Svedev. I'm coming from uh, Svedev. And we are an open uh, society organization for all interested in any kind of development research. We haven't really defined what developmental research is because we want everybody in. We are a few hundred that uh, now and we're growing and we have about 800 more connected researchers. We will have an event here tomorrow, 1645 Alice, which you can uh, ask more questions because we, we are uh, trying to take our own interest and starting up a, how would I say, a discussion forum to improve Swedish development research. We will also have a mingle afterwards. So please feel welcome. We also have a, a table down there. So with this, I have to stop. I think the discussion could have gone on much further. Uh, but thank you for listening. And I will be here these two days. Uh, I'm happy to talk, and the panel will be here. And really, really happy to discuss further anything after this. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.